Welcome back friends. So, as I mentioned in my last class, the focus today is on new criticism, it is a literary theory, but I know some of you are interested in this. If you already know a lot of literary theory, then you may skip to, uh, this. However, those who are interested may please watch it. Uh, the focus will be on the new critics, uh, primarily T. S. Eliot, Wimsett and Beardsley and Clean Brooks and also others and uh, we will be talking about tradition and the individual talent which is uh, at the center of new criticism. So, new criticism remember like formalists focused on the text and argued that literary language is connotative, it evokes deep and secondary meanings. New criticism provides the reader and remember these words close study of text, textual reading. However, they did not insist on separation of form and content like uh, the predecessors. Literary texts were seen as works unified by their devices, motifs, themes and patterns. Their emphasis on the text's internal unity made them uh, concentrate on individual texts um, unlike uh, the Russian formalists who were more interested in general literary devices or the genres. Also, it is important to notice that both formalists, both the formalists and the new critics developed in different times and places and made different assumptions about literature. So, the question is what is new criticism? It is a literary movement, a theory that is started in the late 1920s and 30s and originated in reaction to traditional criticism that new critics saw as largely concerned with matters which were not related to the text, extraneous to the text. Example, the biography, the psychology of the author or the work's relationship to literary history, but they insisted on close reading of the text. They proposed that a work of literary art should be regarded as autonomous and so should not be judged by references to considerations beyond itself, nothing extraneous. A poem consists less of a series of referential and verifiable statements about the real world beyond it than of the presentation and sophistication organization of a set of complex experiences in a verbal form that is what they believed in. It was a reaction against biographical and traditional historical criticism which focused on extra textual materials. New criticism claim that the text as a complex work or a complete work of art is adequate for interpretation and one should look at the text and only the text for its new me or for its real meaning. New criticism therefore is closely associated with the idea of close reading which implies the careful analysis of a text while paying attention to its structure, syntax, figures of speech and so on. A new critic tries to examine the formal element of the text such as characterization, setting of time and place, point of view, plot, images, metaphors, symbols, etc. to interpret the uh, text and its theme. These formal as well as linguistic elements that is ambiguity, paradox, irony, tension are the critics references to interpret and support the theme of a literary work. New critics believe that there is a unique and universal theme in great works of art which is timeless and independent of the reader or even social and historical events. New critics also maintain that these elements are the only true means by uh, which a critic can understand and should un interpret a text. However, there have been critics New criticism is accused of being too restrictive by denying the historical and biographical context which could be true because you cannot separate the man from his work. Okay, and it, the, another allegation was that it is too linguistic and not universally practical. However, new criticism had a far reaching influence. It was practiced from 1920s to early 60s. Today it may not be very popular, though some of its features are still respected such as the notion of close reading. 
One should note that because new critics tried to provide verbal or textual evidences for the claim, they had a fairly objective approach to theory. For this reason, new criticism is also called objective criticism. It is also called intrinsic criticism because again, as I have been telling and at the cost of repeating myself, it is concerned about the text in uh, itself. The major works or the uh, major names include I. E. Richards, T. S. Eliot, Client Brooks, David Deitches, William Empson, uh, John Crow Ransom, Alan Tate, F. R. Lewis, Robert Penn Warren, um, Wimsett, uh, that is W. K. Wimsett, uh, R. P. Blackmer, Rene Welleck, um, and of course, Beardsley, Monroe Beardsley. So, um, meaning resides in the text and not in the reader, that is something that already was uh, mentioned by or proposed by Wimsett and Beardsley in the affective fallacy, we have done that. And then the intentional fallacy again by the same authors Wimsett and Beardsley that says that said that the text is an object which can be appreciated and decoded without recourse to authorial intention. So, new criticism uh, had an intrinsic approach, the reader will have to uh, enter the text in order to unlock its meaning from the inside. In the 19th century and in the early decades of the 20th century, biographical and traditional historical criticism dominated the literary theory, which was practiced in academia and by critics. Uh, people tried to read meanings into um, Wordsworths and Shelley's and all these great romantics personal lives and try to decode their works. It focused on the documents about or related to the text and the author. In its extreme form, it would forget the original text itself. So, the biographical historical uh, tendency was so widely academically accepted that it would be uh, uh, a common assumption in uh, a poetry class for the uh, students to expect a description of the poet's personal and intellectual life. Now, T. S. Eliot, uh, we have already uh, in our last class we talked about him, was among the first to claim that poetry stands for its own and uh, in his various uh, essays based on literary criticism, he asked critics to pay attention to the poem rather than the poet. The poet does not influence the poem with his or her personality and emotions, that is what he said. He also said that a poet uses language in such a way as to incorporate within the poem the impersonal feelings and emotions common to all humankind. I. E. Richards also try to differentiate between the traditional reading of a poem and the modern view of poem. He was less concerned about close reading, but he uh, subscribed to classify, uh, uh, classifying the numerous ways in which reading of poetry could go wrong and one was that uh, historical biographical read approach does not help in understanding a poem. William Empson, I. E. Richards students also followed the, uh, his, uh, his teacher and uh, along with Richards and Eliot, um, T. S. Eliot, Empson contributed to a corpus of acceptable interpretive techniques. In 1941, another new critic, John Crow Ransom, uh, who is uh, generally considered as the philosopher, philosopher general of new criticism, he called the formalist view of analyzing a text, a new criticism and introduce it to American critics in his book, New Criticism. According to Ransom and others, even if uh, um, uh, whatever the author life is, um, there, uh, whatever is the author's intention is, uh, it should be called an intentional fallacy and it should be discredited. Whatever an author says about his work is just an interpretation, just like any other interpretation. So, author's interpretation should not be taken 
literally. When a particular reading is not supported by the text, it need not be valued. New critics also rejected any personal interpretation by referring it to the affective fallacy, which is an understanding or interpretation of a text based on personal feelings, understanding or experiences, which cannot be supported by the text. So, uh, the approach was um, to search meanings within the structure of the text and find it by examining the text through close reading and analyzing the formal elements within the text. This is where new criticism seemed to be a kind of new formalism. In new criticism, one may examine all the evidence provided by the language of the text itself. And uh, this is because new criticism believes that there is such a, uh, a single complete interpretation which is timeless and not related to individual readers or social events. The critic's job is to ascertain the structure of the poem, to see how it operates, to achieve its unity and to discover how meaning evolves directly from the poem itself, that is what they believed in. For example, if a 15th century poet calls someone a nice person, the new critics would in investigate the meaning of the word nice in the 15th century, uh, discovering that at that time nice meant foolish. So, semantics, syntax, imagery meter they were important. Looking carefully at the words, new critics would find both connotations and denotations for each one and uh, uh, different literal and implied meanings they believed create ambiguity. Ambiguity is language's capacity to sustain multiple meanings, which intensifies the complexity of the language. This complexity, which is made um, by organic unity of the text, is a positive characteristic of a text, but should be resolved by the critics. According to critics, multiple meaning of text of a text is the result of four linguistic elements, paradox, irony, ambiguity and tension. Now, remember paradox is an important term. Klienth Brooks has done a lot of work on paradox. It means a statement which seems to be self contradictory. Irony is also a statement or an event which seems to be contrary to its literal uh, sense. An ironic statement presents a meaning which is opposite of the intended meaning. And tension in new criticism means the conflict within the text. These four linguistic devices as well as other figurative devices such as images, symbols, similes and metaphors control the poem's structure. For a close reading of a text, whether the aim of the exercise is to point out rhetorical features, structural elements, cultural references, one should observe particular details and facts within the text carefully. Thus, we can see the intimate relationship between the discussions of structure and irony in many important literary works of the period. For example, Eliot's Wasteland, Ezra Pound's Cantos, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, James Joyce's Ulysses, William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. One of the criticism uh, against uh, new critics was that subjectivity and emotions were ignored and uh, it was too much objective and scientific. Now, according to René Wellick, new criticism is considered not only uh, superseded, uh, obsolete and dead, but somehow mistaken and wrong. He uh, sort of rejects the theory of new criticism and believes that it is uh, uninterested in the human meaning, the social function and effects of literature. So, that is René Wellek and a critique or sorry critic of new criticism. It was also alleged that uh, the new criticism treated literary texts much too autonomous and divorced from the social, political, historical context. And, uh, um, John Crow Ransom in his essay Criticism INC Incorporated advocated that criticism must become scientific, precise and systematic. So, various schools of thoughts. Some of the important texts include Eliot's Tradition, 
and the individual talent and of course, Hamlet and his problems. Ransom's essays, Criticism INC and the Ontological Critic, Wimsett, uh, Wimsett and Beardsley's essays, The Intentional Fallacy, The Affective Fallacy and Client Brooks, The Well Wrought Urn, Studies in the Structure of Poetry. Um, Client Brooks uh, who wrote The Language of Paradox um, uh, and also The, the Well Wrought Urn which uh, you know the language of uh, paradox, paradox, the uh, idea occurs in the well wrought urn. He was an active member of the new critic movement and he outlined the uses of reading poems through paradox as a method of critical interpretation. According to him in literature, the paradox is a literary device consisting of the anomalous juxtaposition of incongruous ideas for the sake of striking exposition or unexpected insight. Paradox for Client Brooks functions as a method of literary composition and analysis, which involves examining apparently contradictory statements and drawing conclusions either to reconcile them or explain their poems. So, Client Brooks advocates the centrality of paradox as a way of understanding and interpreting poetry. So, you should remember these were things, the language of paradox, the well wrought urn, modern poetry and the tradition, these are, a, are his important works. Brooks also illustrates the working of paradox by analyzing um, compose, uh, bef compose bef upon Westminster's bridge verse verse poem in which the speaker, the speaker is able to appreciate the beauty of industrialized London just as he would appreciate any natural phenomenon as he views London as a part of nature having been built by man who himself is a part of nature and who, and who attributes his spark of life to the city. So, Brooks ends his essay with a reading of John Dunn's poem, The Canonization, which uses paradox as its underlying metaphor. Um, in the poem, uh, uh, the speaker's uh, physical love is described as saintly and the two lovers as appropriate candidates for canonization. So, um, according to uh, Brooks, Dern seems to parody both love and religion, but in fact combines in a complex conceit. Brooks also points to secondary paradoxes in the poem, the simultaneous uh, duality and singleness of love. Um, there is no direct historical relationship between new criticism and Russian formalism, uh, each having developed at around the same time, but uh, they independently exist of each other. However, despite this, there are several sim similarities. For example, both movements showed an interest in considering literature on its own terms instead of focusing on its relationship to political, cultural or historical externalities. So, that is all for today. I would urge you to go through tradition and the individual talent and look at it uh, and also Hamlet and his problems and look at both these essays as uh, seminal works of new criticism. Thank you very much.